Good morning and welcome to Backchat. I'm Hugh Chewett and your co-host today is Michael Chigani. Michael, good morning. Morning, Hugh. We're talking in this edition about education for non-Chinese speakers in Hong Kong as the Equal Opportunities Commission accuses the government of creating segregation in our schools. York Chow, chair of the EOC, points out that some schools are made up, to, are made up of 80 to 90 percent ethnic minorities and this amounts to de facto segregation. The Unison Group, meanwhile, is considering a legal challenge to the government over the lack of a second language curriculum in Chinese, which it says means minorities find it hard to acquire Chinese skills even though they are fully committed to a life in Hong Kong. What exactly is the problem then and is the government solution sufficient? Call us 233-88266 or email backchat at rthk.hk or go to our Facebook page backchat on RTHK Radio 3 and comment there. We'd love to hear from you. After 9.15, what if we got rid of the Hong Kong dollar? Joining us for the discussion, we have on the line Paul O'Connor, adjunct assistant professor in the Department of Anthropology at the Chinese University, author of Islam in Hong Kong, Muslims and Everyday Life in China's World City. Uh, Fermi Wong, who's the chairperson of Unison. In our central studio, Kelly Lopo, who's assistant professor in the Faculty of Law at the University of Hong Kong. And uh, also joining us on the line, Kama Minhas, who's president of the Pakistan Association of Hong Kong and a member of the EOC, the Equal Opportunities Commission. Um, Kelly Loper, good morning to you. Hi, good are, morning. Are, you uh, an, are you in a position to spell out in the simplest possible terms, because this is a little complicated, <laughs> what the arrangements are, how things work with uh, the education system for minorities at the moment in Hong Kong? Well, what I am able to spell out, um, hopefully clearly, are some of the legal arguments actually um, uh, related to the legal challenge against the government's policy and education. Um, and I think there's actually a very strong argument that the current policy that leads to de, de facto effective se segregation of ethnic minority students in certain schools, as well as the lack of um, an effective Chinese as a second language curriculum, um, actually falls foul of the race discrimination ordinance, the constitutional right to equality in Hong Kong, and also the numerous uh, international human rights obligations. Okay, that can, Hong Kong can, can you explain by. then what that policy is, what the government policy is? Yeah, well, this is something I think, you know, Fermi Wong and others have been working very, uh, very hard on and could probably answer that question more clearly. Um, my research is focused more on the legal aspects of the problem. Could, do you mind if we get back to you then? Sure. Okay, so we can, if, if we make it clear what, what the policy is at the moment. Perhaps, yeah, Fermi Wong, uh, good morning to you. Thanks, thanks for joining us. Um, I, I have a statement from the uh, Education Bureau. Um, um, that we did invite them, of course, to join this program. They were not able to provide a spokesperson, but they did provide us with quite a long, lengthy <laughs> and largely incomprehensible uh, statement. Um, Fermi Wong, can you spell out uh, what the government policy is at the moment on uh, education of minorities, and in particular Chinese language education for minorities? In fact, the uh, uh, government policy uh, for every minorities the core is integration. Integration, you know, but it's empty slogan, you know, nothing, you know, inside yet. And integration, and also they assume that all children in Hong Kong, regardless their race or background, cultural background, they can, they should learn the same curriculum, the central Chinese curriculum, without any extra support. If they can't do it, they can opt for the GCSE, which is the UK-based uh, examination, uh, the highest uh, grade equivalent to the local primary two. So uh, this is, you know, you either go to mainstream school, swim or sink, or you go to designated school to learn a very, very low level of Chinese. That is the policy. But why is there, I mean, I'm just trying to understand this. Uh, uh, we just heard earlier from, from, from uh, Ms. Loper that, that, that uh, this falls foul of certain rules and regulations and law in Hong Kong on yeah. discrimination. Mm -hmm. And you're saying that uh, the government wants to have integration, yet yeah. we're not seeing that kind of integration now. No. Uh, why is there such resistance to, as what you propose, a, allowing them to learn Chinese as the second language? Why is there such opposition to this? In fact, you know, uh, the EDB, if we, you know, um, look into their history, their track record, they never respect equal opportunities. You look to the, you know, to the gender discrimination case and also the disability uh, court case. Okay, now we put into uh, every artist. In fact, for the senior government officials, I mean mainly from education, they do not care. They do not concern this group of children's well-being or the long-term development. So the policy, they just say, okay, we have an integration, but de facto, we're the second grader. And then what they do, they change the name 
from definite school, definite school into 22 words in English and 31 words in Chinese. And then they said it's already solved the, uh, we solved the second question effect. What we are proposing, you have uh, two things have been long calling. The first one, we provide systematic Chinese as a second language curriculum that will, you know, all those assessment to. So what kind of assessment. difference does that make? I mean, learning okay. it now uh, okay. and, and learning a second language, how, how does that help? Okay. Uh, because now the, our policy, Chinese, is based on the first language, the mm -hmm. native speakers. And then, of course, we assume that all children, they have a, somehow, they have a, some background, cultural background, and then, you know, the family can help quite a lot. And then, but we're talking about every Maldives, the Chinese, for sure, is their second language. Okay, we don't talk about third or fourth. But or if you second teach language. it as a second language, how, yeah. what kind of difference does that make? Okay, it's very different. The curriculum design, the teaching materials, the teacher training, and also will be very different. And the more importantly is the methodology that, you know, the teaching and the learning is different. But I must, you know, uh, suggest that Chinese as a second language is not necessarily PC at low level. It's we have a goal to, you know, to allow our FMRT to catch up with the local, but the teaching method and also the support is very different from those who learn in the first language. Uh, what's wrong with the designated schools? Isn't that, a, isn't that uh, in principle, uh, um, uh, the best place for people to learn Chinese as a second language? No. For those des designated schools, now we have uh, uh, 31 designated schools. And then among 31, we have uh, 13. That, you know, they have uh, more than 90% or 99% uh, the FMRT students. First of all, you know, they make the language learning contest really, really weak. They can only, you know, speak in their mother tongue, Urdu, Hindi, Nepali, or English. And there's no interaction with Chinese students. And language is not only, you know, learned in, uh, from some lessons that they need to interact, to, to talk to the, those, you know, native speakers. Another is, you know, is a way so segregation uh, effect. It's really harm to their long-term integration. I tell you, for those graduates come to UNISAN to seeking employment, because if they really lack of Chinese uh, proficiency, and also another point is that they know nothing about Hong Kong society. Okay, those schools, the EDB stresses that the, the, they, the, the EDB does not designate schools as, as designated schools. The the the, uh, the parents choose to go to those schools. The schools uh, choose to uh, accept funding and professional support with a view to better nurturing the the uh, non Chinese speaking students. Okay, this is a rubbish argument. First of all, the parents are misled because, you know, they, they in their, you know, uh, primary one and secondary one uh, schools, you know, um, uh, 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 choices information. The EDB says that, okay, for those schools, they provide school-based Chinese curriculum. But for our parents, they never know that their children are going to learn a very, very basic Chinese that will not have them to future employment or further study. This one, they are misled. What, what Secondly, they, what they, but... mainstream school no support. So... So you either, you know, swim or sink. So what we, we you know, do is because that's in the school, at least they can be, uh, you know, happy food. What, what if they just taught Chinese better in the designated schools? No. The designated school, because lack of language um, uh, learning environment, what the school can do is only to, you know, prepare them to sit for the GCSE. i give you an example. Is some students from mainstream primary school, but they could not catch up. They have uh, many only have a primary two or three level when they graduate uh, from primary six. And then they go to the secondary, second, uh, designated schools. They have to learn P1, P2 level again in six years. And then they sit for the GCSE level. They are Chinese never advanced in the secondary schools. Okay, let's go to Kamar Minhas now from the Equal Opportunities Commission. Good morning to you. Um, Good morning. Th th thanks for joining us. Um, yeah, would, it be, would, it, would it be feasible to have non-Chinese speakers um, spread out among mainstream schools when the whole curriculum, the whole operation of the school is in, is in Chinese and every subject is being taught in Chinese, being studied in, in Chinese, H how would you work with people who have little or no Chinese uh, in, in that environment? Uh, thank you very much for having me. Uh, as such, you know, equal access to education for all children must be provided without discrimination of any kind including on the ground of race, religion, and ethnicity. Now, what happened in 1998, 307 government-aided secondary schools 
switched from English medium to Chinese medium. The effect of the switch was the number of possible secondary schools that EM children could attend was drastically reduced. Now, regulating most of them to a handful, then three schools that offer Hindi or two languages classes. In response to this, the government of Hong Kong has set up designated schools to serve the primary education institution that receive a recurrent grant with a view to enabling them to develop teaching and learning material designed to cater to the specific, specific need of EM children in learning of Chinese. As a result, steadily growing proportion of EM children are enrolling in those designated schools. Now, it was a basically wrong idea uh, to establish the designated school by putting uh, I will say uh, white sheep in one corner and black sheep into the other Yeah, but corner, you know, you, you know. The, the question from Hugh was, uh, if you don't speak the language and if you put somebody, put a kid into that school that teaches everything in Chinese and you don't have that language school, you're not going to learn anyway. Yeah, Michael. actually, that, that, that's why, that's why uh, you know, uh, what we are advocating is that there should be... Um, uh, Chinese should be developed as a second language for ethnic minorities. So uh, that whole curriculum should be changed and uh, develop a new, new system, you know, uh, to cater the EM children in the local schools. When Chinese kids go to schools that teach in English, uh, yeah. is that English taught as a second language or as a first language? It's taught as a second language. So when you've got English yeah. schools here, and then uh, these schools are supposed to be teaching in English, and a majority of those kids are, I suppose, local Chinese, but they're learning as a second language? Yes. Okay, yes. Michael, I, okay, I, I want to, you know, our proposal is that, you know, now we we know that um, the majority of MMRT uh, children, their age is really, you know, young, in the, especially in those in kindergarten level. And we believe child learn very fast. That if we have a systematic support in the kindergarten level and also as well as in the primary uh, school level, that you know they can learn, uh, you know, uh, quite good with uh, extra support. And also another thing is, you know, if uh, we we have experienced that, you know, for those children, if they go to mainstream schools with critical mass like ten percent or twenty percent, every minority in school, and the school. Uh, are able to have extra Chinese teacher who are trained at teaching Chinese as a second language and then uh, systematic support. And we see that if, you know, around primary five, if, uh, you know, they can catch up and then all the way, no problem at all. We have uh, this kind of cases. But now the problem is they are too concentrated and that the, learn, you know, the background of the student highly diverse and the school, you know, cannot manage it. So. Now the problem is the government failed to support in the kindergarten level. Okay, you have overseas experience. We never see that any other advanced country like USA, Canada, they have a light distance school for Chinese, Hong Kong immigrants, and then ask them to learn English up to the primary too. What they can do is, like, you know, for some immigrants from mainland China, Taiwan, Hong Kong, go to Canada or other countries, they also they don't know English very well. And then the country or the school board, they will give them ESL, English as Second Language, extra support, very, very intensive language support until they are able to comprehend what is happening inside the mainstream classroom and then they put them in and then have a teacher just all the way to follow up until two, three years and then they can do it. Let's get to our I think that... Is I Paula think... Paula Yeah, I think uh, EDB should develop an alternative Chinese curriculum examination with a standard between the HKDSE and GCSE. This would allow EM students to attain a certain level of Chinese proficiency, which leads to recognized qualification for those who cannot attain the level of requirement in the normal curriculum, but still want to proper proof of their ability at the lower level, considerably higher than the GCSE primary three in mainstream schools. Okay, let's go to uh, Paul O'Connor now from, from the Chinese University. Good morning to you. Hi, good morning. Uh, uh, and thanks for joining us. Um, it seems that you know, minorities, non-Chinese speaking minorities, have fundamentally different 
educational requirements, basically, because of that language, because it's the medium of instruction, Chinese is a medium of instruction, doesn't it make sense to have, have uh, put, them in, put, put them aside and treat them in a special way in, in a designated school, maybe improve the teaching of Chinese there, uh, but, but the, the, the requirements and the system is, the, uh, the, 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 what they need is so different that they should be treated differently. Um, I don't. I don't really agree with that at all. And I think that the, the broad strokes of the the argument here fall into two categories. First of all, um, as Fermi has as well outlined, there is a desperate need for um, a, a pedagogy, a, a science of education in Hong Kong that can actually transmit the knowledge of teaching Chinese to non-Chinese speakers. Um, currently, the the focus and the success has always been um, really getting people completely immersed and, and having a lot of family support, a lot of uh, focus to get this language learned. Now, if we take the premise that language is culture anyway, there is a great deal that has to be done for children and families that don't have a competence in Chinese that may in many cases also be new to Hong Kong and they might not be arriving during the kindergarten years. So there needs to be a way to adapt a, a specific curriculum to uh, ethnic minorities. And currently that's totally being overlooked. And it's quite right. If you go, if you're a, a, a non-English speaker and you go to uh, an English-speaking country, for example, you go to Australia, you go to the United Kingdom or America, you're immediately put into an EASL or EAL class. Now here in Hong Kong, you, you already mentioned about um, Chinese speakers in English schools. Well, that is also the case. If Chinese speakers, uh, Chinese children with a uh, Chinese language in their family background go to an English-speaking school, uh, an international school, for example, they're going to be put into an EAL class if their language is not up to par. So that's one of the issues. The other issue that um, maybe I can contribute most to is the fact that these, a lot of my research has really been involved with, with um young Muslims and also ethnic minorities, ethnic minority youth, these children are Hong Kong people. They grow up in Hong Kong and often they have um, a competence in Cantonese at a spoken level anyway. And what is being missed uh, along the route is actually giving them access to the Hong Kong identity and actually allowing them to contribute to the territory. And if we think historically that South Asian people have been here in Hong Kong contributing to society and, and um, working and living in this society for over 170 years. So they're a long-standing community. But currently, there is a real oversight in allowing them to access. And, I, and, and recent research in 2005, Ku et al., they actually spoke to young people and found out that amongst the South Asian population in this designated school, 78% wanted to learn Chinese. They actually wanted to be taught in Chinese rather than English and rather than their mother tongue. So what is the logic, <coughs> sorry, excuse me, what is the logic in having uh, non-Chinese um, non speakers arrive in a Chinese-speaking territory and asking them to be taught in English? Well, you tell, you tell us the logic because we've had this discussion through the uh, Donald Jung administration, now the Si Wai Leung administration, before then the Tung Chi Wai administration. We've gone through a number of education secretaries, and these are politically appointed people, and then you have the civil service. And, and throughout all these years, there has been this resistance to what you and Fermi and everybody else want. Is it because they just simply don't care, they don't, they don't think the numbers are large enough, or that it's just racism? What is it? I would say it's worth a sum. It's uh, uh, especially those you know top uh, education officers. But they know, have come themselves. and gone. You know, it was Michael Shin. Yeah. Yeah. Now was Edding. Yeah, but it's institutional. Michael, it's institutional discrimination. First of all, you know, if it's coming out, a new officer will say, "Hell, for the former one did not do it. Why should I do it?" And then you see all those top officers still there. Mrs. Cherry J come and go, and then now is the primary, uh, permanent secretary. And her mentality is that South Asian are lazy and motivated. It's very true. Everybody knows it. Who and said they this? Who said, who said this? Many. No, can you name one deputy. person? Okay, the deputy. You can ask, you know, uh, in Hong Kong, you, we have an uh, open conference with overseas scholars. And the EDB representative is say, oh, I don't know why they just can't learn, and they don't want to learn. I said, who said that? 
But if you name that person, you can take that person to the Equal Opportunities Commission. Why don't you name yeah. that person and take that person there? Can I now, because you were talking about it's institutional, that you can look into the policy, to the curriculum design, and then you know it's very difficult to change. I know that, okay, now, um, Mrs. Carrie Lam and Siwa Lau, yeah, they seem, you know, uh, care about it. But now the problem, the barrier is from the EDB. Okay, let's yeah. let's bring back now Kelly Loper. Perhaps <laughs> um, uh, what is would, uh, we've got a clearer idea perhaps now of the government policy, the government attitude. What do you see are the legal problems in that? Well, I mean, I think the bottom line really is whether or not the policies that we've been talking about actually can ensure equal opportunities for the ethnic minority students. And I think clearly the numbers that we've been seeing over the years, and Michael's made a very good point, we've been talking about this for a very long time, and not much has really happened, and we haven't really resolved the problem. Um, I think it's becoming urgent. We're, we're going to lose another generation of, of ethnic minority children uh, to this policy, and we need to really look and study and see, okay, are these policies working? They, they don't seem to be working. We have under-representation of ethnic minority students at various levels of education. Um, I really want to emphasize the point about segregation. I mean, putting students off into separate schools, I mean, not only doesn't it doesn't work in terms of Chinese language okay, skills. The, okay, the EDB says it doesn't put students off into certain schools. Well, I think the numbers say otherwise. I mean, there, there is, whether or not there's intent. The, the parents um, might choose to go to those schools. The schools might 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 right. choose to structure but, themselves so they're more yeah. attractive to but, students. But the EDB and the government doesn't force anybody to go to those schools. Yeah, but again, I mean, it's, it's really about choice, isn't it? I and mean, we've been talking about the fact that there really are no other options for for some of these families um, they can't go to mainstream schools because they don't have sufficient support to learn Chinese in order to succeed in mainstream schools they can't afford to send their kids to international schools or ESF schools so they have to go to these other schools so the EDB doesn't force them but the, the conditions are such that they have no other choice to go to right exactly to to and school. I think I think another really important point um, about the law is that it doesn't really matter what the purpose or the intent of the policy is. I mean, the government could have all the best intentions. I don't actually think that they do, and I would agree with Fermi's analysis of the situation. I mean, it is a lack of political will as well, and, and, and policy inertia in this area, that's very clear. Um, but in any event, the intent and the purpose doesn't matter. Um, segregation is clearly, um, what, for whatever reason, is clear, clearly racial discrimination under the Race Discrimination Ordinance. Um, if a policy effectively um, excludes ethnic minority children from education, then that's also racial discrimination. Is that an actionable case here? You say it's clearly... Absolutely. It, if there is an actionable case, why hasn't it been taken to court? Well. Uh, that's a good question. I mean, I think that there's, there, it, it, there's a very strong argument. I think that it could succeed. Our courts have, have taken a very robust view of the constitutional right to equality. We now have the race discrimination ordinance. I think it would have a good chance of succeeding. And as I understand, Unison and others are looking into this possibility. I mean, I think the EOC, um, it's, a, it's a great... Uh, development that they've announced or that York Chow has announced that there's going to be or possibly going to be a formal investigation but honestly this is long overdue all of this is long overdue can anybody it, just take the case to court if yeah, a parent I, if a parent says this is segregation I'm gonna I'm gonna sue the government yeah. can that work yes uh, but now because you know we expect UC should do it because EUC has the power to access to the internal information the data all those things but if a parent will go to the high court directly, it's a civil claim. It's very difficult. So in EUC has the power and the resources to do it. And EUC has a function we call it a formal investigation that, you know, without any um, complaints, they can still look into the uh, institutional discrimination. And your child just announced two days ago that, you know, uh, they are going to do it if nothing in uh, the coming policy adjusts. You know, to um, resolve the problem, uh, of course, you know, the U.S. is going to conduct a formal investigation. But you accept that if, a, if an ethnic minority child wanted to... Fermi, are you still there? Uh, yeah, 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 okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay, you could even nothing when I was a child wanted to go to an ordinary uh, mainstream Chinese school. Oh, um, yeah, of course. That they, yeah. you, you'd need special teachers, you'd need special curriculum, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. so on. So, are you saying that this, this should be available uh, at every school in, in Hong Kong? 
Okay, uh, we put into this way. Um, uh, first of all, uh, every mouth is highly diverse. But you know, for unison, you know, those come to us. Almost, you know, 100% they want to learn effective Chinese and mm. also learn with Chinese students. That is mainstream schools. But the worry there is no lack of support. What they want is enough support and then they are happy to go because for the long-term development. And of course, we are not saying that every school now with around 1,100 uh, government subsidized primary and secondary schools. And then we propose the government that, okay, look, you can, you know, just according to the school net. In the primary school with school net and also secondary. And then you invite those, you know, schools in a better quality, have a heart to serve every minority. And then you give, you know, have a quota, I mean, like 10% to 20%, not more than 20% uh, every minority. And then you give them extra Chinese teachers, extra resources and support. And then I believe at the end of the day, our every minority student can learn with the Chinese. So you, you, you have a quota, you have sort of semi segregation. <laughs> no, really, no, 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 it's in terms of resources, but of course, for the ideal is, you know, our FMRT should be free to choose any school they want to go. You know, in Australia, even one student, they provide ESL teacher mm. okay. or, you know, their program. But now in Hong Kong, you know, for the pilot, we can have a such, you know, in graduate, every school should have the, this kind of a support. Okay, well, we, we've got to break for the, for the news at nine o'clock. We're very much glad to hear from, from listeners. You can email bank chat at rthk.hk with your thoughts or give us a call on 233 eight. Two six six, or go to our Facebook page and comment there. We'll get to some comments uh, after the news. Before that, the weather. It's going to be cloudy today with a couple of showers at first. Sunny periods then during the day and a maximum temperature of about 32 degrees. Slightly cooler mornings the next couple